welcome. Could we have everybody grab the last little bit of food that they have on their plate and sit down? We are just about to begin. First of all, welcome very much. I'm Liz Lambert. I'm the president of the Native American Arts Council here at the Portland Art Museum. And we want to welcome all of our members, our council members, but we also want to welcome all of the guests that are here this evening. We're delighted to have you and so happy that you could come out on a Friday evening and enjoy uh, meeting this wonderful artist with us. The Native American Arts Council, see we can't let an opportunity like this go by without telling you a little bit about what we are about. The Native American Art Council is a group of people who really enjoy Native American art. We work and learn about the Native American collection that is in the Portland Art Museum. We travel, which is wonderful, to, to wonderful far and near sites and learn about Native American art. We also love to help the museum collect pieces of Native American art. And we have Kaila Farrell Smith, whose work we just recently collected. We have some Lillian Pitt, and she's here this evening, and we're hoping to sometime get some more. And we're working constantly to make collections and add to the museum's collection. Our next event, for those of you who are members, is the December 12th holiday party. And we hope that everybody is able to come to that. If you're interested in joining us, you could still make it to that party if you wanted to become a member of the Native American Arts Council. You need to be a member of the Portland Art Museum and then you can join the council. There are seven councils. We think we're the very best council, but uh, we certainly have a great time and we invite you to join us. And there's membership materials back at the table where you signed in. There are books available by Jean. There are just a few left, so if you're interested, they're back there at the table that's on the right of the door as you came in. And I, they were ordered by the museum, and that's all the museum has at this point. So if you're interested, be sure you grab one this, this evening. We'd also like to now introduce Dina Dart. She is our curator. That's another benefit that we who are members of the Native American Art Council have, and that is that we get to enjoy a lot of really great time with our curator, Dina. And we certainly love to have her here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Liz, and um, thanks to all of you who, for coming out tonight. Um, on behalf of the Portland Art Museum, I'd like to welcome Jean, quick to see Smith here, and, um, and all of the wonderful women who work to bring her here, um, and, and her friends who are helping to host her while she's here to make sure that her needs are met and that she's comfortable, and um, we're just thrilled to have you here, Jean. Um, the books in the back, just a quick clarification, aren't actually written by Jean, but they're about Jean's work um, by a, a curator, the curator of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum um, in Santa Fe, Carolyn Kastner. Um, there, it is a lovely little monograph. Um, so um, there's that. I'm not gonna take up a bunch of time telling you about Native American art at the Portland Art Museum, except to tell you that we are doing some really fun and exciting things and getting ready to, um, things are getting ready to explode actually in the, um, in the Native American collection. We are um, possibly um, going to receive a half million dollars um, from the Mellon Foundation to train um, Native art historians. So. Um, two two-year paid internship positions for a pre-doc um, native scholar. Um, we're also writing a grant to, um, to transform the Discovery Center into a center for alternative voices, so a place where um, contemporary native art can be shown and, um, and native people can create the context that they choose to bring to it rather than um, some kind of curatorial context placed on it. Um, so we're trying some new things and, um, and, and um, expanding the terrain and, and I'm quite excited about it. We have, uh, I have great support here um, and the Native American Art Council is, um, is a big part of that support. And um, so thanks to you guys for providing the, the food and the, um, and the atmosphere and all of the work to put this together. And, um, and especially Mary Jo Hessel, 
Um, I wanted to ask you up really quick, Mary Jo, uh, we have a little gift for you for um, pulling this together and putting all this work into, um, into hosting John tonight. Supported. And, um, and she's been worrying night and day and baking cookies. Um, so, um, so bless you, Mary Jo. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to introduce John um, so that we can hear from her, because that's why you're here, not to hear from me. Jean Quick to see Smith calls herself a cultural art worker. She uses humor and satire to examine myths, stereotypes, and the paradox of American Indian life, in contrast to the consumerism of American society. Her work is philosophically centered in her strong traditional beliefs and political activism. Smith is internationally known as an artist, curator, lecturer, printmaker, and professor. She was born at St. Ignatius Mission on her reservation, is an enrolled Salish member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation of Montana. She holds four honorary doctorates from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Massachusetts College of Art, and the, Met and the University of New Mexico. Her work is in collections at the Whitney Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Walker, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Recent awards include a grant from the Joan Mitchell Foundation to archive her work, the 2011 Art Table Artist Award, Moore College Visionary Woman Award of 2011, Introduction to the National Academy of Art 2011, Living Artist of Distinction, George O'Keefe Museum, New Mexico 2012, the Switzer Award of 2012. Wow. Please join me in welcoming warmly Jean Quick to see Smith. Good evening, and I'm really happy to see all of you here this evening for Mary Jo Hessel's um, sake. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I have to thank the Portland Women in Art, of course, for their lecture series for Fall 213 uh, about the, the incredible organization they put together. Uh, Marie Civic, Prudence Roberts, Rachel Siegel, Elizabeth Bilyeu, Linda Gerber, Sue Taylor, Christine Weber at the Portland Community College System, which is, by the way, it, the, one of the most incredible systems that Kat and I have seen. And uh, we also want to thank Pam uh, and the Native American Council, Mary Jo Hessel, Dina Dart, Liz Lambert, and all of you who have helped put this together this evening. I'm really touched by this. And of course, I'm thrilled to see my old friend here at Lillian Pitt in the front row because that means a lot to me to have her here. Um, the two of us have been through this for many, many years and like two little road warriors, we've had lots of battle scars uh, that we could share. And, and my dear friend, uh, Nancy Siegler, who went to first grade with me and then I lost sight of her for over 30 years and she came from Seattle just to be here. So I'm thrilled about that. Finally, my heartfelt thanks to Kat Griefen, co-director of the Ecola Griefen Gallery in New York for her abiding faith and for her support of my work and plus the countless hours she spent in pulling this together with Marie Civic and PCC to make this event possible. Uh, this evening what I want to do is, because this is a Native American Council, I, I want to share uh, some information with you. Um, one, is, one is a little bit about uh, contemporary art, where it is today, and uh, some of the changes in contemporary Native art. So I thought that you would enjoy that. I showed some yesterday in, in my other talk, but now, uh, tonight, what I want to do is, um, and I just need a little bigger desk here, okay, uh, is do that, and then I have a couple of poems that I've written, they're just short, but they explain what I'm doing. And um, then Wilma Mankiller wrote a book and I want to read a little passage from that uh, for my work, which gives some explanation about my work, my will to survive. 
And, um, and then I want to tell you where, where the status of Native American art is today. And I want to share that because you, the council, can make change. You can, you can change things and make something happen. So that's what I, I would like to leave with you. And maybe uh, in the future, maybe do some further work with you. I would really like to do that. I, I want to start by reading this poem, which explains uh, something about Native art that in the beginning, art had no name. Art turned to the unseen, uh, turned the visible the t into the tangible. Art made mysterious, the mysterious less frightening. Art had purpose, art had purpose. In the beginning, art was so integrated in the community that music, dance, poetry, painting, and the narrative were not separate entities, and they had purpose. In the beginning, artists were the shaman, artists choreographed the dances, Artists blessed the hunt with soot and ochre on rock walls, and artists passed the people's history down. Through storytelling and poetry, art had purpose. In the beginning, art recorded life. Art healed the sick. Art celebrated life. Art uplifted life. Art explained the mysteries. Art really did have purpose. Art had purpose. And in my, uh, in my estimation, Native American art uh, does still have purpose because it serves all of those purposes today. And I can't say that totally about all American art, but my, my belief in my 40 years of traveling and preaching about Native American art is that it, it does have purpose and it does all of these things. Steve Jobs, why would I use this? <laughs> Steve Jobs said, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. They have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, you can glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They really do, they really change things. They invent things, they imagine, they heal, they explore, they create, they inspire. They push the human race forward. This is what the creative process does. This is what critical thinking does. This is why it's so important to keep art in our public schools. Maybe they have to be crazy, he said. How else can you stare at an empty canvas and see a work of art, or sit in silence and hear a song that's never been written, or gaze at a red planet and see a laboratory on wheels? And of course, he believes that he made tools for those kind of people. Uh, <laughs> and artists. Artists do love Macs. They do love their Macs. <laughs> um, now what I'm going to do is tell you, before, before I show you these images of Native art, I want to tell you a little bit about where Native art is today. Some of the changes in the contemporary Native art community that I personally witnessed include seeing more Indian women involved. This is really true. Lillian and I have lived this and young university trained Indian artists were living this and scholars appearing everywhere across the US. A disappointment is the lack of major, and I say over 100 pieces of contemporary art, collections of contemporary native art. Um, the Idle George Museum um, in the mid 90s asked me what they should do with a grant and I recommended to them that they do a, a, a biennial, like the Whitney Biennial. The Heard Museum had asked me the same thing in 1986, and I recommended the same thing to them, and I asked them to please collect from every biennial. The Heard did not do that, and their biennial ran for about 20 years, and they dropped it, but there's very little collecting. The Idle Jord began collecting, as I suggested to them, and they do have a nice collection. I gave the Missoula Art Museum money and a promise of all of, of all of my prints through my lifetime. And the Missoula Museum has continued to make great strides. And I would say they have the largest collection of contemporary native art on the Northern Plains. And I'm still working on that collection. Um, you know, uh, a disappointment is this lack of major collections by either private collectors or public and private museums. And when private collectors tell me, or museums, that no, we can't afford to purchase, <clears throat> I always say to them, you can afford to buy prints or drawings. You could afford to begin that way. And once it's like a collection together, it's like a magnet, and you will bring in other collectors in collection. 
Further, there are very few scholarly books on contemporary Native art. The few that mention contemporary are 90% artifacts and traditional art from history. There have been no major traveling exhibitions with a significant catalog of both men and women's contemporary art, such as the multiple exhibits of African American or Latino art. And one day I just went on the web and I counted 60 major books and exhibits on African American art that are currently touring. Latino art is something similar. So, uh, you know, this is the dilemma that we have. And um, it's going to take it's going to take a while for this to change, but I see that your, uh, uh, your group here in this museum is working on making that change. So you are one of the few in the United States, and the only one I know has an arts council, a Native American arts council inside the museum. So you should be very proud of what you've accomplished here. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a little inside secret about Native art. Native art generally has no horizon line. And the reason for that is because when we pray, we pray to all four cardinal directions is because the sky and the land are intertwined. Even groundwater recharge under the ground, it's all connected together. So like when I saw science books when I was a child and um, you would see a, a cloud up here, and then you'd see the rain come out, <clears throat> it would go into the river and go down the river to the ocean and come back into that cloud. <clears throat> That was what we saw for science. In the native world, <clears throat> it would come, the water might come out of that cloud <clears throat> and come down to earth, but then it always traveled through wood tick, deer, you know, the human being, through, uh, you know, the skunk, the crow, and, and all of that before it ever, ever went to the ocean. So, yeah, I've got a little, I've got a little, little in here, thanks. Um, Sorry, I've been doing a lot of extra talking. And <laughs> I have a lot to say, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I've been given a few places to say it here this week. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that generally when you see landscapes by Native Americans, you're going to see, like, often things that are kind of map-like. And um, it's not that any Native American person really thought about it or did it intentionally on purpose or said, oh, I like what that Indian is doing, so I'm gonna do this over here. No, it's when these things happen, because I spend so much time looking at other Native art besides my own and then trying to figure things out. It's taken me years to come to this conclusion, but now I see why. And on the, on the right-hand side, Ed Saxon, who's a Navajo, left his Navajo also. Um, he's, he's got a horizon line, but there's a good reason for that because Jimmy Abeda left the reservation, went to the Chicago Art Institute, and when he came back to the reservation, he began teaching. You see a lot of Navajos with the horizon line, but you don't see that in uh, all the rest of our tribes, unless sometimes like Kay Walking Stick, who lived in the East and um, and went to the institutions there. And she continues to do that, but now she's putting native design over the top. And on the left, Conrad House has what I call Indian Art Deco. So you can see, uh, well, Art Deco in America came from Native Americans, by the way. So uh, we have lots of buildings in, in New Mexico, but also in New York and other places uh, with, with uh, Art Deco. And those designs did, they, they didn't come from Europe. In Europe, they came from Austria, from the Werkstatt, and not, not, not from America. So there's a difference uh, there, and we're not taught that in school. So here, uh, you see on the left side, Conrad House, and this is a story about his grandfather, but you see the sheep, you see the rain clouds. He's got a whole narrative going on inside, inside of this. And, um, and uh, they have a large family, and Conrad learned to speak Navajo. And Navajo has the old Shakespearean style, and then they have the new street lingo. So like my friend Emmy Whitehorse only speaks like the street lingo. The reason how, how, why Conrad learned this old Shakespearean style was because his grandfather spoke that style, but he was a medicine man, and he sang the songs. 
And now, like Jewish people, if I have any Jewish friends in the room here, like Jewish people who go uh, through um, synagogue as children, and they begin singing the Torah in the beginning, uh, this is how Navajos learn the language. This is the old way. They sang the songs, and the grandfather sang the songs to him. So uh, he learned this old style. And I remember one time we were in a room together, and Emmy and he were arguing about the words cat and horse, and they each had different words for them. But if you can imagine in your head Shakespeare and then you know street language, um, uh, that was the difference in the Navajo being spoken today and the old Navajo. So at any rate, I got off track right here. Um, okay, now I, I, have a, I have a clicker here. Okay, tell me how I'm moving on here to go forward. Where do I go to go forward? There's, where, there's right lots here. of arrows. Okay, go here. Go this here. Forward, I think. Okay, let's. Okay, Hello? good. Sure. Now, some people would question whether this is landscape, but for Indian people, this is landscape. Uh, all this is is landscape with something in it. It's landscape with activity in it. It's got Indian activity, so it's really landscape. So <clears throat> she's got a blanket in the upper left-hand corner, <clears throat> and, um, and she's got cars decorated for Crow Fair. This is Wendy Redstar, by the way. <clears throat> and then down in the lower left-hand side, uh, she has a res car, and, uh, but she's done something different. And this is contemporary. So you must understand that, that she's, she's mixing together photography you know, and handwork together. And when you see this, this is like kind of Andy Warhol-ish, isn't it? So uh, I find this really exciting when I see young people doing things like this, because this is taking things that I know about and then putting it into a new context. And somebody else would look at this probably in New York and say, why would anybody take a, a you know, a, a, car, a broken down car and then put it in this sweet uh, field of pink? But for me, it just makes me chuckle every time I see this. As a native person, I mean to think about all those reservation cars that we have at home and then to see it in this sweet field of pink, the way she's placed it, and then this, you know, <clears throat> kind of negative. And over here, <clears throat> are HUD houses, and she's just stacked them up <coughs> kind of totem style here, and, and put some Lichtenstein sw swishes of paint uh, through, through there, and, uh, and this too makes me chuckle and laugh, because over the years, whenever I've gone home or to another reservation, I like to take photographs of the HUD houses, because people try to make them uniquely your, their own, and they're always the same size and the same style, and they all look alike from Alaska to Florida to New Mexico to Minneapolis. They're, they're all the same. The government builds them all the same. And then Indian people decorate them and try to make them different. So that one, too, that one, too, dazzles me. Um, Emmy Whitehorse, who I went to school with many years ago, uh, does um, hand... Uh, <coughs> oil stick on paper, and then she glues it to canvas. <clears throat> on the left is Crystal Woman with her dad's, <clears throat> her dad's horse brands and other things that she mixes together uh, from the reservation plants uh, and uh, things that she sees. On the right is Seawall. These are about 40 by 60. Here's, here are two K walking stick pieces, and I talked about the landscape, and she does make a horizon line, but now she's begun putting these abstract uh, images over the top of some of the landscape, which remind me of Parflaches. Although she's Cherokee from Oklahoma, she's been doing a lot of work from Idaho and Montana around my reservation and around the Plateau reservation uh, reservations. Julie Buffalo Head, who's a Potawatomi, um, does these what look like children's books, and they're not really. They they tell they tell very serious stories and. <clears throat> and um, really uh, American history. On the left side, you'll see the, the Columbus ships in the bathtub, and you'll see Coyote like aiming his, his arrows toward those, and she calls them the Columbus prophecies. And there's, there's a self-portrait of her. She's often in the picture somewhere. And on the right-hand side is the Lone Ranger rides again, and so uh, you know we have that movie coming out, and, 
of course, Lone Ranger can talk and Tano only talks in baby talk. So she's making fun of that uh, here. And um, she's one of my favorite new young artists. Um, John Fedorov lives in Seattle and he's half Naf, a whole and a half Russian. And uh, he's a really bright young man. He's made a city picture here. Uh, now there is a, a skyline here and a horizon line, but he's kind of mixed things up here. And he's talking about the spirits in the land who reside everywhere. And so for Indian people, all of our stories come out of the landscape. And he's showing that the clouds are, the clouds are talking. He's showing them as real people. On the right-hand side, you see um, uh, Jeffrey Chapman, who is from, who's Chippewa from Minnesota, who's Lillian's friend and mine. And he's, this is a creation story. The little otter that's under the doorknob is Genesis. In Genesis, you know, uh, there, or, you know how the, the world was formed. But here, this is after the great flood, the otter brings up, this is a creation story for Chippewa, the otter brings up little bits of dirt from under the waters <clears throat> and forms a, an island for the people to stand on. So we all have these creation stories and actually you could go around the world and I wish some writer would, sometime would do that and bring forth creation stories because they're all different. Mine is different on my reservation. The raven, of course, brought the sun in on the northwest coast up here. <clears throat> Coyote helped the motkin turn on the lights on my reservation. <clears throat> so here you see this wise elder peering around the door. Often, like if you go to the reservation, you see the elders were very quiet and they're just watching things and they're watching this passing scene. And Jim Denemy <clears throat> down below, who's uh, this incredible Chippewa man, Ojibwa, he's, um, he's showing the, the trees that are cut and you see uh, the horse flying through and a rocket <coughs> flying through. Often his narrative pieces sometimes are more fanciful uh, but sometimes you can see serious stories in, in what he's showing you. And Ernie Pepion, <clears throat> who's a Blackfeet uh, a friend of mine who passed away uh, this past decade, and he believed that a good way to die uh, was to uh, uh, die with his, as an old man with his paintbrush. But, you know, he paraphrased that from Little Big Man from the movie, uh, this is a good day to die. Remember when the grandfather laid down and then the raindrop came and he opened one eye and decided, he got up and decided, today's not the day I'm gonna die. But, um, <laughs> but Ernie made this, this painting and Ernie was quadriplegic so he had to have a nurse put the paintbrush in his hand. He could paint a 60 by 90 painting. He's got some of the most lush paintings that I've ever seen in Indian country. And um, I adored him and his art and uh, so you see his wheelchair over here taking off. He wanted to get married. He wanted to have a regular life. So he painted his dreams. So you see down below, down here, he's, he's dreaming. He's in a horse race. When he was young, he raced horses. Then he went to Vietnam. He came back. And then he had a bad accident. Over here, you see the buffalo coming across the rim rocks. I'll mention that later. You'll see why. <clears throat> And he shows himself at peace out there with his best friends, a wolf and a buffalo. He's got his teepee. He's got everything he needs in life right there. Um, and now here's, he, here's a different kind of landscape. Here's something that's really edgy and, and new. And this is Stephen Yazzie, who is Navajo, lives in Arizona, married, got a child. And um, these are kind of apocalyptic paintings. But you know, I also see Edward Hopper in here. And so, um, uh, so I find that really interesting that he can take Edward Hopper and then uh, and instead of having empty rooms with a single human being, a nude standing there, he's got this uh, coyote standing here. You know, the trickster coyote, the trickster. I find that really interesting. Here's not some more landscapes here, some without horizon line. And uh, Norman Akers, who's Osage uh, in Oklahoma, and teaches the University of Kansas, makes these incredible prints and paintings. Upper left is a painting with symbols, Osage symbols. He's very religious and he attends ceremonies. And here you, you'll see Star Wallowing Bull, who's Arapaho and Chippewa. 
these, these are all, uh, I'm sorry, this is Frank, his father, uh, uh, Frank Big Bear. And the reason why they've each got a different name is that they had split up early and he took his mother's Arapaho name, Wallowing Bull. So Frank Big Bear, this is the father, does these um, incredible drawings with color pencil, which I just find so tedious and yet they're just brilliant when you see them. They're velvety and gorgeous and, and lush. Okay, but now here's the sun, the two upper ones. You, so you can see he, he's noticed, he's, you know, there's a resemblance to his father. And yet he puts pop symbols, mixes them in with the old traditional things. And also there's a feel here of George Morisot, um, uh, Morisot from Canada, not George, that's Morrison, uh, from Canada, the man who passed away just recently. George, what's his name, Morisot, in Canada? No, is it? No, not Norval. Oh, well, I'll think of it. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, and then I'll break into something. Um, okay, down below, uh, right, right down below, is um, Andrea Carlson, who's also Chippewa. Now, see, these are all, all Chippewas I'm showing you. I've shown you like four, five Chippewas here. And, uh, you know, n no one's work resembles except for father and son here. And she's talking about consumerism, but she takes images from Japanese ceramics. She takes it from all over. And, um, and, then, and then kind of collages these, these images together with paint, color, pencil. And of course, here's our old friend Joe Federson, who has been here in Portland many a time. I'm sure everyone in the room knows him. He's a longtime friend of Lillian's and mine. And uh, he's plateau like I am. And our tribes are related. He's Okanagan, I'm Salish, uh, but, uh, but our tribes speak the same language. And for years and years, he had a little basket collection of plateau baskets. And, and you know, Joe thinks deeply, carefully, meditatively. I mean, everyone who knows him, he's a deep thinker, very quiet. And it takes him a while to move, where Lillian and I just get out there and we, you know, do that, and then we make mistakes, and then we have to back up and do that. He doesn't do that. He just, he's just a guy who, who steps very carefully, cautiously, one step at a time, and then he makes these brilliant things. So he uses barcodes and parking, parking lot designs and um, electrical towers, and, and he's making these big glass baskets now that we saw yesterday that are like this big around and this high. So. He's doing these incredible, okay, here's a handmade basket that he wove on the left because he just wanted to know how they were made. So he taught himself to weave, unless Nettie Kunikai or um, Pat Gold and Pat Courtney Gold, she, she taught, yeah. Okay, so he, he learned. Okay, there's one of his glass baskets with the, with the power, you see the, those power lines in, on the left? In that case, right on the left. And, and, um, and then he, oh, that installation, those are all prints. They're prints on paper, one at a time that he put together until he made that huge mural. I mean, that's the way he, that's the way he thinks. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is just show you quickly some new ceramics. Okay, this is Les Naminga, who is a, um, a, a young man in the Southwest. His, his father is Dan Naminga. Uh, um, yeah, Dan Naminga. And, um, and he's doing like new things with pottery. And I'm always amazed at when I look at how he pastiches things together. It's like a big collage and he just throws it in there. He just, he's like, and look at, he's got words in there. He's like just, he's just like buzzing. He's just going to town with this. And I like get so excited when I see the kids doing stuff like this. And of course, Diego Romero, who <clears throat> has become so famous and so expensive. Um, his, <laughs> I guess that goes with the territory. And so look at, he, he uses, like he uses Mimbre pottery as a, ta as a place to take off, to tell his stories. And of course here he's showing Cortez cutting off the feet and legs and hands of an Indian person because that's what happened there in the Southwest. So there's always this friction between the Indians and the Hispanics over uh, Spanish and Spanish and Indian because of this. So we have to have statues here with the uh, um, Hispanic stuff. And then every once in a while, some Indian will want to put up a statue with the feet missing, and then it causes a big ruckus. So, uh, you know, you, 
<laughs> need to have a little, a little of both. Okay, so um, Lisa Holt in Harlan, Riano, Cochiti, and Santo Domingo, these are graffiti kids, there's no, no doubt here, but they're also using Spanish colonial art from the 1600s. I mean, it's, it's got old and new all mixed together. And every time I see their stuff, I just get so excited because it's all this new stuff that's going on here with these kids. I mean, they have no fear, they're fearless. Um, talk about fearless, here's Rick Bartow with the new poles that he made for NMEI, that's NMEI in the background, the New Indian Museum. And he's got a coyote, he always has coyotes in everything. And this was a lithograph that I just purchased recently, so the lithograph down here in the corner. And then this is one of his drawings. You see he draws exquisitely. He's, he, is a, he is a masterful craftsman. Speaking of masterful, this is a woman whose work I watched for many, many, many years. And I remember when she used to make small little sculptures that would fit in your hand like this. And she did this and then she just like strutted her stuff and went out there and when well, she got carpal tunnel, that was one reason why she stopped making the small stuff. And she had to come up with a new plan. And when she came up with her new plan, you know, she, she started doing things like, you know, this pole over here and uh, she who watches. And, you know, and then she got involved with Maya Lin and that whole Columbia River project. She's got several pieces if you haven't seen this. Uh, this is some, some special place to visit. You see some pictures on the web of people coming and getting their picture taken, coming from Japan just to get their picture taken under that arch right there. So it's a worthwhile visit to tour her, her public art pieces. This young man, Jeffrey Gibson, is um, Choctaw and Cherokee. He lives in New York and he's making in um, Rochelle. This is what I wanted you to see today. Are you here? Can you see me? Okay. And this, she, so this is a box with what he called parflash designs. No, no, no. It's futurism or Russian constructivism. And when you say, oh, these are parflash designs, you tell some curator that, and then they have to believe that. I mean, they will believe that if you say that. And you say it with authority. But we know differently. And so that's like no parflash we ever saw. So, okay, and over here, he found all of these um, boxing, these boxing, um, what do you call them, punching bags. He found these, and then they were on sale. That was like a yard sale or something. He got them really cheap, and he decided to cut up his paintings, which weren't working anyway, and just put them on here, and now they're working. And so people are really loving this, and he's got jingles on here, and he sometimes puts beadwork, but he doesn't do the beadwork. He pays somebody to do the beadwork. I mean, that's when you really begin to be an artist, when you pay somebody to do it. <laughs> so, all right. And some sculpture, I'm gonna show just a couple sculptural things here, we, uh, Rick Bartow. And then, um, and then this is Bob Hauzus, who's the son of Alan Hauser. And, um, hmm, I lost him on here. Okay. And um, one on the right-hand side is, it are pieces that he made for the airport in Phoenix. And so I love all of his little, I mean, notice it, it at first, at first glance, it looks fairly simplistic, but then when you begin to look at it and you notice that the hummingbird is over here, which is a, a Southwest symbol for Indian people, particularly uh, Hopi people, and then you notice that that little hummingbird looks almost like mosquitoes, but no, they're airplanes bombarding the little hummingbird. And then if you look on the left, you see, you know, um, there's a crow there, but oh, all of a sudden, inside of that is a little hummingbird. And so he has, he has a, he, he's got just a, a, a marvelous way he tells his stories. On the left is a, a quite a bit more, um, up front, I mean, he made this <laughs> Apache pull toy of a, of a cowboy. He took it. He took it out on the mesa, and then he shot it full of bullet holes. That's his Apache pull toy for his children. <clears throat> so, uh, so that one, that one has a, a bit more realism. Um, Jimmy Durham, who, uh, by the way, Jeffrey Gibson uh, was just announced the other day. He's in the Whitney Biennial in New York. So. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that we have two Indians in there this year, and this is a this this sets a record. And Jimmy Durham's been in there one other time, um, 
but I can't think of Fritz Schulder never made it to Whitney Biennial, so no one else has. I suspect that uh, Marie Watt is probably gonna be next, I would guess. But Jimmy Durham is back in it, Jeffrey Gibson is in it, so to have two Indians in it is pretty exciting. These are some sculptures of his, and of course he's been out on the leading front and showing in European uh, museums uh, for the past 20 some years, and it's, it's pretty exciting that he's gonna come back to New York <clears throat> There's quibbling about uh, about his uh, heritage, uh, but you know he's been writing about Indian art, making art that we see as native, and uh, you know I'm proud to claim him. What I want to tell you is that you know some of these artists are now very conceptual, and you see those two baskets with laundry down at the bottom, and I had to write this down because I couldn't remember the exact words, but these are shrouds and swaddling clothes of decommissioned saints. <laughs> I mean, not two baskets of dirty laundry, but shrouds and swaddling clothes of decommissioned saints. And he was doing that when there was all the brouhaha about our Catholic priests in this country and all those things going on. So, you know, he's got a, a, he's got a terrific sense of humor and uh, I just, I always am dazzled by his stuff. And of course, Marie Watt, your, your young star here in Portland, she's just gonna make you all so proud. I mean, there's just no two ways about this. And you know, her, her uh, blanket poles, and you're gonna run out of blankets though at the rate she's going because <laughs> she's built, making stuff for museums all over the country in Europe. So uh, I don't, you think the, they're gonna have to speed up the blanket manufacturing here. <clears throat> And that pole in the middle is actually, is actually wood, it's cedar. <clears throat> they, she gets a CAD cam and then you know, puts the, you know, that's all taken from computerized, it's all taken from a computer. On the left is a huge tapestry, kind of a Saul Wet, Louet, uh, Louet uh, kind of tapestry in a way. But this is, takes huge sewing circles and volunteers to come to her house for a bowl of soup to help her sew these things together. And again, it's gonna take, um, maybe it's gonna take people, more, more and more people to come and sew these for her. Now this is a man in Seattle who, you know, 30 years ago was transcending um, a traditional art. He would make carvings like on the right hand side, but then he would like cut them all apart and then repaint them in a new way and put them back together. He's Clinkett, uh, his name was Jim Schopert, and. Uh, I used to just adore his work, adore him, and then, uh, he, and then he died one day suddenly, which is very sad, a great loss to the Indian community. But he was doing these things way, way early on. These are some more sculptors. I just put them all together in a group here. On the top left is a 56 Chevy that Dwight Billadu, uh, whose Blackfeet lives on my reservation, has been married to three Salish women, so he's kind of like part of our... <laughs> Part, we kind of claim him now. And then on the right-hand side is, um, is Lorenzo Clayton, who's Navajo, lives in New York. He's a printmaker. This is a sculpture, uh, and, and even though it's almost 2D, it's only like maybe three inches thick, and then, you know, sets against the wall. <clears throat> Has pictures of his family on it here, and then uh, symbols, Navajo symbols in it. On the bottom left is uh, Stockbridge Muncie, uh, Native American Al Wadzinski who lives in Minneapolis and he uses a lot of yard sale stuff and he puts it together and there's golf clubs and silverware, clocks and everything to make big eagles and things like that. This is about six feet high. It's, it's really a big piece. And on the right hand side uh, is Nicholas Gallinan who just got an award from the Otto George Museum and he, uh, he, he's often carved books <clears throat> Uh, books into faces, into his own face as well as other Indian faces. Here he's carved cedar on one side, put faces or hands like there would be totems, and then and then just left the wood on the other side. He's a new young hot star, somebody that you should all watch here because he's uh, he's really moving. Now these are older artists here on the left hand side is Jeff Thomas who's photographed Native Americans for years. This was featured in Art News. And, um, and then uh, Mrs. Whiteman runs him, whose crow was uh, photographed by Kathleen 
Westcott many years ago. And right below is Jesse Coudé, uh, who shows his self-portrait with a uh, clinket mask over his face because that's kind of how he's seen. Now, but see, now here's, a, here's another new young hot star here. This is Will Wilson, who lives in Santa Fe, he's Navajo, showing the environment up at the top. And then down here on the left side, he shows himself as a Navajo and then as a cowboy, because he's half Navajo and I guess maybe half cowboy like, like, uh, like uh, Marie Watt. But <clears throat> uh, she says she's half Indian, half cow, cowgirl, cowboy. And, um, and then a student of his on the right-hand side who uh, you know, uh, dressed up and then uh, t had her photograph taken. So some more photography here. Jolene Rickard up at the top shown uh, shown as part of the three sisters in the ground. The Iroquois say our faces come from beneath the ground. And if you think about it for a minute, you know, the mother eats the plants and the plants go in the belly, feed the baby. Our faces do come from beneath the ground. It's only when we put ourselves in those steel boxes that are going to float around out in solar space, and unless they're dug for steel first, uh, that, um, you know, that our faces do come from beneath the ground. We Indian people all believe that, that that's where... That's, this is the Mother Earth, and this is the solar dust, and this is what we're made out of. And so the corn beans and squash, uh, three sisters, she shows herself at peace there. And on the bottom is James Luna. And you notice that James Luna has uh, long hair on one side and short hair on the other side, and he's trying to show the different parts of himself. He's showing that he's uh, Mexican, that he's Native American, Pre, and he's also called himself pre-Columbian and post-Columbian, which works too. And then <clears throat> on the right is Tom Fields, <clears throat> who's Cherokee. And Tom Fields lives in Oklahoma, and he's worked at the TV station in Oklahoma City. This is his son, Ngozi, uh, when he first got his hair cut. And for Indian people, haircuts, you know, going back in history have been a very uh, difficult situation because the government would take the children all my family, all Lillian's family, off to school and cut their hair off. And then if they could retrieve a piece of hair and hide it under their bed, they would try to pin it on before they came home. They were so ashamed. And a lot of times you would see Indian men have to pin their hair back on to dance because it was, it was a mark of, of, of terrible, horrible shame to not have your hair. So Indian people have this stigma about hair. So Negosi getting his hair cut, this is like a ceremony here. This is something really. Okay, so James Luna, uh, ever the clown, ever the performance artist, laid himself down in a bed of sand, put little notes down the side about where he fell off his trike. He got this scar when he took off his reading wing when he got divorced. He got that, that white line. And he tells you all these things about his personal life right here. And then he lays in here with his eyes closed, notice his feet sticking out. And people actually, in this, he liked to do it in the Indian museums where there's lots of dead stuff. So then you see all the people walking up close to him and they would like lean in and kind of whisper about how real he looked. <laughs> and so he was like, he was like ever the trickster. This was so. So now, 20 years later, here again, here's the, the young people doing all this stuff. Here's this young woman who's cheeky, Erica Lord, and she lays herself down in this vitrine and she does a similar thing to recreate him and to commemorate this. And, and uh, the piece on the right hand side is I tan to look more native. She went to a tanning salon and took the tape put the tape on and then had her back tanned because she's half Finnish and half Yupik. Now here's another new young native who just got an award from the Idlejord Museum in Indianapolis. She's like 22 years old. She is um, Gerald McMaster's daughter. Merle, anybody, it's, you all know Gerald McMaster? Let me see, who knows Gerald? Woo, two people, whoa. Uh, the, so we need to do some training with this Indian Council. <laughs> Gerald McMaster is the uh, Gerald McMaster is the most important curator in Canada, who actually was called into the Australian Biennial, and so um, uh, you know his daughter had quite an upbringing here with him because he's such a brilliant guy, and so. Uh, you see her here dressing herself up. She makes these incredible costumes and then photographs herself. And sometimes there's blood dripping on the snow and they're really drama. And, you know, it probably has 
a little bit to do with native art, but a lot of it is, you know, her her being dramatic. Okay, here's here's another. This is another native woman here, Maria Hopfield, who's Canadian. She's Cree. She's brilliant. She's very bright. She's gorgeous to look at. She came into my show in New York. Cat hired her, brought her in, and she did a performance in there. And so you see her performance on the twins. And notice in my painting, see the see those spots there in, in the painting. And she, re she came in and visited all the work, and then she made up a performance to go with it. And over on the left was black ice, and she's crackling some kind of plastic for the ice. And in the center is some of her sculpture, which is very Boisean. She's, uh, she's very knowledgeable about art. And this woman here, Rebecca Belmore, has been in the Venice Biennale. She's Canadian, she's Cree. She is an incredible dramatist and full of passion about everything. And uh, this was um, a piece, two pieces that she did notice. Like over here, you just even wonder how this thing is supposed to work. Look at how this is all bound together. But this kind of thing she does. Here's something she did early on. She made this megaphone, and there was like a big fight between the government and the Mohawks. There was a protest. So she got all as many Mohawks out there as she could, and she just wanted them to sound off. She set this out on a hill. They could just go up there, and they could swear at the government. They could tell them off. They could get it out of there. Everybody had something to say. She got them all out there. It made everybody feel better. Um, <laughs> Okay, all right, we're gonna breeze through this. My son is an artist, he's a professor, he's working with the Joan Mitchell, he wears 10 hats. He's, got a, he's a musician, he was gonna be a rock star. These are his uh, 30 by 40 uh, monoprints and drawings here of birds that we see around us at home. Also with our, with our plateau um, pictographs all floating through the air there. And then the self-portrait, this right down in the corner here, there's a canoe. But if you saw the numbers on the canoe, you would see there's Star Trek. It's the Star Trek ship. And that's my son there, that teensy beensy little roadrunner out there. That's what I think of him. He was always steering his own ship when he was a kid. And so he's still doing that to this day. Um, Lillian can vouch for that. This is one of his paintings. This was about um, guns and all that. He loves comic books and Star Trek. and so. You know, he turns into a kid when he gets in the studio and here's all this, he puts all this stuff together, but these are like huge, big sheets of paper that I can't even lift off the press. And uh, that he, and here he's, he's stolen some Catlin and, and uh, some other things. Uh, we've been going to ceremonies um, with my cousin at Blackfeet, the Medicine Lodge ceremonies, and this, this is our teepee at night. But so he, then he went back in the studio and he made a, he made a teepee that's abstract in your home uh, here out of neon that's it, about six feet high. And here's some paintings that he's doing right now. These are self-portraits. So, um, so he's there about 10 feet high. He gets bigger, bigger, bigger than life. Okay, here's, here's a family portrait. Me in the upper right hand side, the original quick to see. Here's my son down below and my father when he was 16. Then, you know, uh, when I was, um, when, when I was a kid, I, um, here, I'm trying to find my, my notes here. When I was a kid, I went to, I started school. I hadn't seen crayons and paint, and I ate crayons and tasted the paint and tasted the paste. Library paste was my favorite. The crayons were too crumbly in my mouth, and so they, they smelled good, like, like grape knee high, but they didn't taste very good. <laughs> then, then when I was 13, I rode in the, I went to work for the Nisei Farmers when I was eight, got my social security card, and worked uh, year round after school and on the weekends. And I rode into town in the back of a pickup truck to see Toulouse Lautrec, the movie. That was my first exposure to an artist's life. And I was like so dazzled, so swept away. I mean, and so I came home and I got my father's axle grease, and you see, I made a See, I made a pallet, and I got the neighbor man down the road to come. We didn't have a camera and take my picture so I could be that. And I didn't know there were women artists. I just saw there were men. And so I didn't care how I got there. 
uh, I, just, I just wanted to be it. That was what I wanted to do with my life. So then when I was 16, I sent away for the famous artist course. And um, in the back of the matchbook cover, my dad let me use my bean picking money to do that. And so uh, when, I got the, when I got the books, all the teachers were men. And the, there weren't any women in there again, so I thought they were all men. And then they all had these cigarettes like that. So I took up smoking because I thought it was going to transform me. It was going to make me into an artist. I wanted to be an artist so bad that I figured however I had to do it, whatever I had to do, I was going to transform myself. You know, I was thinking in my own brain that, you know, it's like when you wanted to test God. Remember, you put the handkerchief out in the lawn to see if it was going to be wet or dry in the morning, and then you would know there was really God because you talked to him and you told him. Do you remember? Did you do that? No? <laughs> OK. When I went to art school at Reinhardt, we had to study this. You see this tree? This is the history of art in America. There are two women in here. I think it's Helen Frankenthaler, and I think it's uh, George O'Keefe. There are no Indians in here in the tree. There are no Indians. But they do have. Um, they do have Egyptian art and Greek art and some things like that. So remember, this is American art. And they're, so we're going to address that later. I'm going to show you how we do that. And when I was in art school, it was all men from the Korean War. This is not the picture of my class. I couldn't find it. So this is. <laughs> and and, and we, only had the, we only had the nude men in the, in the class. You know, everyone has not just, you, you can't say you got there on your own. There's just no such thing. So I made a list here of people who, who have helped me. And these are not the only people, but they're some of the people. And I thought you'd like to see some of these people here. My tribe, of course, my father, my husband, my son, Neil, and my beloved cousin, Gerald Slater. And then, you know, people like Jules Pfeiffer. I mean, that's not, that's not bad to get help from Jules Pfeiffer. And uh, Stavon Vicente and Miriam Shapiro, you know, Fritz Shoulder, Patty Parsons. I mean, this is a nice list of people. Scott Mamaday, David Keel at the uh, Whitney Museum, Lucy Lepard, Bernice Steinbaum, and so on. And now I can add Kat's name to that list and, and uh, Kristen from the Ecola uh, uh, Grief and Gallery in New York, and Kat, who's here with us. OK, and as a, as a young Indian, you know, we did our interviews with the paper, and so here we are with the Great Canyon, and these are brochures and shows that I did. A newspaper came out to photograph me with my horse, and notice that painting is on that garbage can, and so you can see it's kind of a setup. And then I did the first photographing ourselves, the first uh, Native American um, photography show in the country of contemporary photography traveling in this country. And also it went to Europe. The first traveling show of Sweetgrass, Cedar, and Sage. And where's, there's Gail Tremblay, there's Jolene Rickard, I'm in the back. Who else, who else do I see here? Uh, where's Lillian in here, Gail? Oh, she's hiding behind that lady. Yeah, she's there. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. She's right, yeah, OK. So, and then I had recommended the biennial to the Heard Museum, as I said earlier. These are all shows that I organized and um, uh, that, went, that went to Europe or other places or across this country. This is a photograph show that I sent to Europe, to Scotland. This is an um, Adelaide conference that I uh, helped organize uh, many, many years ago. And here's a show in Germany with Dorothy Piper, um, a show that I organized for a gallery in Santa Fe. I've been working with the writers and um, in collaboration with the writers for many years. So I have lots of book covers with them. And a um, public art piece in San Francisco in the Yerba Buena Garden to honor the Ohlone people. So those stones came out of Shingle Springs, out of Death Valley. And then there's a wooden wall that says, see yourself under this sky in this place. See the beautiful designs over there? On any day, you can see people sitting here in Yerba Buena Park in San Francisco, uh, children skipping on the rocks. You can see, there I am out there in Death Valley talking to the guy who helped me uh, bring the rocks into the city. 
and a, a trail in West Seattle, if you ever get there, it's a mile long. Joe Federson and I uh, have pavers and images. This is a collaboration between me and my son at, for the Denver airport. We just finished this recently. And uh, we did the fancy design down here, which they turned down because they're gonna tear this floor out in two years. So this is a temporary fill-in terrazzo. So they just wanted three colors. So, But it's drawing people. And you see, there's a, a flash mob. See, there, they came, and, and they came to gather and dance on that floor, which is sort of cool. My son and I do workshops, non-toxic workshops, on, in monoprinting all over the United States with people who are uh, uh, handicapped. Here we're at the George O'Keefe. This, uh, this is my son. This is my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters. And we're, so there's three generations here working on this. This is my son, Neil, my handsome son on the left there, and um, with the curator, Peter Nguyen. And here we are in New Orleans uh, doing uh, prints with children who've never done prints before. So we were just dazzled by the work. That's Neil there. And Neil and I just collaborated on this kite. See the, this kite? Um, it's, t it's 12 feet wide and about five feet high. It's flying over the Pishkins in Montana. Pishkins, everybody knows that, right? You know Pishkin, the buffalo jump? I can see, I have to come back and talk to the council. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, d uh, this is the, the memorial the, in Oklahoma City. There were 12 people brought in, landscape designers, interior designers. There was only one Indian, only one person, uh, only one artist on that crew, and that's me there that was there. The Governor's Award in New Mexico, and um, some old, old drawings. It, this is my short history of the United States. The Snow White came from Europa and she kissed the frog in America and he turned into a ledger book prince and uh, they made all the corn into Fritos and they put everything up for sale. And then, and then it says made in the USA in Spanglish. Um, <clears throat> and I've got, uh, Lots of big icons for big paintings. So I have horses, buffalo, uh, canoes, women's dresses, and then I have some little sideline things like paper dolls for a post-Columbian world, and I've got smallpox suits here that fit the whole family because the blankets came up in the canoes and gave us all smallpox. And uh, there used to be men who lost their hair. My father talked about this. And then we went to the Catholic school and got uh, got a good education that taught us how to be maids in Missoula for the white people and the men how to be gardeners. Um, that was our, the extent of the education in my family. And this is a McFlag because America gets McBig, McBigger, and McBiggest. This is a collaboration between Neil and me and he made these Mickey Mouse ears in the um, tail. And speaking to the ancestors, so I have, I have the the Indian people here talking to one another about pens that write upside down and, and about things that go to Mars and telling all the new news. I have some old news, but I'm telling the new news. This is my self-portrait uh, made in the USA. I've got my enrollment number on here. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the newspaper had Three Dog Night coming in here for sobriety on, on Route 93, and Three Dog Night were some of the druggies in the 60s. So. Maybe they've changed. But this is the, this, this portrait is the Vitruvian man, in case you didn't recognize it, with a medicine wheel over my, over my body. And a, and a large, a big log canoe with uh, all the mascot things that people like for the ball games. And then I have a sign on the wall that says that if you like these gifts, I'll trade these gifts for land with white people because they like these gifts. And uh, here's another trade canoe. I'll trade, I'll trade reindeer, grizzly bears, eagles for these ba petroleum baskets here because we have to protect the endangered loggers. Here's a map of the United States with all European presence erased. All that's left are the names, Indian names of all these places. And then you see down here, 
And then up here is Nunavut, which is the latest state. This is at the SAM, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Dresses, I've done lots of dresses. This is like Mother Earth, it's a cut wing, but it really represents the Earth. Who leads, who follows, uh, which is always an interesting notion when you watch the news. Like, how do these idiots get into power? And then you see, I notice I have all the, I have all the people moving around the, here because we're all the same size. I have us all. And over here saying prayers because when the elders say prayers, they bless the insects, they bless the ripples in the water, they bless the leaves. And I put some of the images in here and then I have little talking points in here about what you need to say prayers. Here's my own body wasting away with my limbs falling apart, you know, because I'm old now, all these things, and the lizard is eating part of me. And then Turtle Island, it's raising its back in the Great Flood, and um, uh, this is like a map of America here. It's got the moon, and it's got a river, and it's got petroglyphs, and, and um, on the right-hand side is about rain because, because we were in terrible drought, so I'm making paintings about war and rain, water and war. Um, and so there's lots of, uh, lots of things in here about water. War on the left-hand side, women are trapped, the babies are trapped in war. I have Guernica images here, Picasso. I have a little devil up there at the left. And underwater, I mean underwater, the housing was underwater, uh, the Midwest was underwater. And then after all my drought paintings, all of a sudden we got a flash flood in my studio. And so I was underwater. And, and on the left is a snake dance, praying for the water, bringing the water. I've been to the snake dances. That's where the men carry the snakes in their mouth at Hopi and on their belts and all that. So I made another painting that was supposed to bring water, which, which eventually it did, as I said. On the right is oppression. And notice he's got his foot on this guy's head. So it's a whole little story here about being oppressed. And women's bodies that carry, that carry the plants, they eat the plants, and, and so you see it going through her body. Notice there's a rabbit over here to the right. So there's always a trickster in there someplace. And uh, here are the faces of America. Um, this is a little painting with lots of maize designs from America throughout the Americas. And in this piece, uh, it's called Sissy after Sisyphus, who has to climb the mountain. I'm showing homeless people going up the mountain. My daughter was homeless for a while this past year. And here she's got, this woman has a baby. She's never gonna make it. And these are piles of expensive, luxurious things here for rich people. But here she is, she's never gonna make it. There's one thing I want you to remember is to celebrate 40,000 years of American art, not 200, not 400, 40,000 years of American art. And I want to share one thing with you before uh, Kat and I do a little dialogue. I would like to tell you that culture here, which is what we're talking about tonight, uh, makes is our identity. It makes us different one from another. Culture is our history, yours and mine. Culture tells us who we are. Robots and computers will never have it. And if you take your soma pill, you won't have it either. Culture can be our creation myth. Did coyote capture the sun? Did a voice say, let there be light? Culture is our creation story. Did God on high create the humans first and make them most important? Or did the creator place the animals, the land, and the humans in a holistic world? Culture is our birthing method. Do we sit up, do we lay down, or do we squat? Culture can be the way we greet the newborn child. Is it washed in mother's urine? Is it held to the morning sun or slapped on the back? Culture is our umbilical cord. Do we bury it, do we carry it, or do we throw it away? Do you all know what that means, the umbilical cord? I see mm, Indians are going mm, and everybody else is going mm, mm. Uh, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that later. Culture can be our notion of beauty. Is it the tattoo on our chin, the red clay in our hair, or walking with spike sticks under our heels? Spike sticks. Who's got six inch sticks under their heels here? Good. Culture can be the way we bury our dead. Do we push a raft into the river, make a clay mound above the ground, or sprinkle ash from a plain? 
Culture defines the way we teach our children through stories about the plants, the animals, and the earth, or through stories about Star Wars, Spider-Man, Dragon Ball Z, or SpongeBob SquarePants. Culture defines the way we dance in a lambada, the fancy dance, a square dance, or the salsa. Culture defines our social group, the country club, the Bloods and Crips, the RV campers, or the bingo mafia. Culture is how we greet one another. Do we kiss cheeks, give handshakes, high fives, bow, or kiss noses, rub noses? Culture is language, slang, humor, gestures, dance, religion, ceremony, clothing, music, art, folkways, taboos, literature, foods, oral history, institutions, systems, governments, and more. That's your culture, that's your identity. It's yours and mine. Thank you. That was great. Incredible. Um, I think I'm speechless. That's hard to do. Um, I think because we're going a little long. I think instead of doing most of the dialogue between us, let's take questions from the audience, and I'll we can I can insert some here and there if we have time. Does that sound good? Great. Because um, everyone's come to see you, we want to hear. Is there questions from the audience about any of the material, um, or especially I think we want to hear maybe some more about your own work too, because we got um, questions. One right there, yeah. You know, I'm really struck by your comment that there hasn't been any significant traveling exhibition or catalog or scholarly work of contemporary Native art. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it too hard? Is it too foreign? Is it too specialized? Is it, yeah. what, what's the deal? And I'm going to repeat the questions just because I mic'd for the uh, so why, the, the question is, why has there not been a serious major show, a traveling show of Native American art? Um, why do you think that that is the case? Sorry to make that short, but. There, there, I think all the reasons that you gave, those and more. I mean, I tried to sell a book to Yale Press, to Fidon, and Fidon said, oh, Yale Press said they wanted anthropologists to write it, not art critics, and then, um, and then uh, Fidon said, uh, we're a niche market. We're a niche market. And then somebody, somebody else said, oh, your, your population is too small. No one would be interested. So you know, there have been, there have been traveling shows of Mexican art, uh, traveling shows of Haitian art, traveling shows of Cuban art. Um, um, oh, uh, uh, Bosnian art but none of Native American art. And so I just think it's, it's time, you know? Yeah. I do. I saw some other hands too before. Yes? And now they're gone? <laughs> Is that the case? There you go. Yeah, go ahead. What usually happens is, uh, I will, I, what happens is that I will go out to do a gig like this and then I look for the nearest reservation. So like I, when I was here 20 years ago or something, Lillian took me out to Warm Springs and um, I think I did a slideshow at that time. But I, I'll, do, I'll do the model print workshop which takes some doing to get it set up. I'll do it inside of a museum or at a school and I especially, I've, I've worked just lately here, just lately I've worked with, um, veterans, um, and as you saw, the, the porch in New Orleans, which was a poor district that was flooded, uh, and uh, these, were, these were children that were disadvantaged children by any definition. Um, with uh, people who are in wheelchairs, I've been going to places like that to do these model print workshops, and often I find people who have not ever made a print, sometimes no art, like the veterans, when I worked with the veterans, everybody in that group had never made art before. And then I, I went to a mental institution in Missouri when I was there for that show and brought a whole group from a mental institution. That was a new experience for me. 
it was a new experience for them, but it was also a new one for me because uh, we ran into, my son and I ran into all kinds of glitches with that. But we had, you know, we had people there from the institutions. So, so yeah, I've been doing this for quite a while now. And um, it's always a joy for me because monoprinting is like nothing else. It's, it's always luminous and beautiful. And, you know, when we're using the ink that's easy to wash up, uh, people can take something home with them. They take, and there's always a surprise. And there's always a success. You don't have to know how to draw. It just comes out just, it's just beautiful, no matter what you do. So uh, it's, it's a win-win all the way around. And I love doing it with people. I love seeing their faces of joy, children, elders, you know, in a rest home. It's, it's just a great thing. Any of you artists who are here, I encourage you to, to do something like this because it's, it's really joyful. It really is joyful. It makes your heart feel good. Have you ever thought about <clears throat> working in the motion picture field? Because there's so many stories that can be told about India, so you have a wonderful visual presentation. But when you get into the film, it's a whole other world. The it's question is, is, have you ever had any experiences working in film? Uh, and do, I mean, do you want to have experience working with film through another way to tell your stories? This is about my limit. I mean, having a film crew in the back of the room. <laughs> and so, uh, so my friend Nancy here was telling me that she found videos on YouTube, um, and I I haven't looked there because I'm not crazy about. It. But you know, I, I'm I'm kind of old for that. I'm not so photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> we don't agree. I think we probably just time for one more question okay. at this point. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, American culture loves superstars. And yes. Paintings, movies. Yes. Yes. Is there an uh, Native American? Oh yeah. Of course. Of course. Who, who's the Native American? Who are the Native American well, superstars? Well, we have we have superstars. I guess you could say it that way. But actually, what we have are divas who think they're superstars. <laughs> None are here Can in this I room, of them? course. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you privately. <laughs> this lady had a question. Okay, one more. Go ahead. You're right. You know, I talked to a lawyer about starting a foundation, and the, the problem I have is that I don't have enough wealth to start a foundation. No wealth, I've got work. But, um, but my idea was to do exactly that, was to begin the foundation to begin writing curriculum for the public schools because there's a dying need for that, a desperate need. So if you give me your card, and, um, and I'll give you my card, then what I'll do is I'll write you little notes and ask you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think on, on that note, we want to um, thank the museum so much for hosting Jean and bring uh, Dina Dart and Liz Lambert up again to yeah, kind of to close out the them. evening. Yeah. So thank you yeah. so much. That was incredible. Thank you so much, Jean. We, we have a gift 
um, the Native American Art Council, the Portland Art Museum. Um, that, thanks to Lillian. Um, yeah, thanks to Lillian. Um, but we have a gift to thank you for coming and for sharing your beautiful work with us and, um, and, and the vision that you have for Native American artists. Honorable. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and, um, and drive carefully on your way home. Grab a little